sermon series I am if you remember we started off in Exodus chapter 3 now we are culminating in John chapter 15 I'm excited to get this over with I hope that you've learned something I hope that it has blessed your life as much as, as it has blessed our life uh, we also want to just keep in mind all those who are affected by COVID all those who are uh, stuck indoors I'm praying that you are in good spirits but if you don't mind meet me in John chapter 15 John chapter 15, I'm going to begin reading at verse number one, and I'm going to culminate actually at verse number five. So if you have it um, here, John writes, he says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, and whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Beloved, for those that are not horticultural or arboricultural enthusiasts, there are two major classifications of plant tissue. On the one hand, you have what is called living wood. That's the tissue that is healthy, the tissue that is, is growing and fruitful. However, um, when the branches of a plant, uh, particularly a tree, die, uh, they give it this term entitled dead wood. And so, my brothers and sisters, what I want you to understand is that there are a plethora of reasons as to why branches and stems and axes of a plant die. If you think about it, if a branch is damaged or undergoes physical trauma, then the branch can become dead wood. Uh, dead wood can occur whenever uh, the plants are harmed and killed uh, by pathogens. If the branch is structurally unsound, the branch can become dead wood. There's funguses out there that can affect the tissues of a branch, and if the tissues uh, become damaged, then the branch itself becomes dead wood. There are bacterium species out there that secrete enzymes and toxins uh, that liquefy tissues into what we call soft rot, and if enough soft rot accumulates, then the branch becomes dead wood. There's viruses and viroids that lead to dead wood. There's nematodes that lead to dead wood. There are parasites that lead to dead wood, and horticulturalists, uh, they can recognize dead wood long before uh, you actually cut the branch open. And though oftentimes it's not easy to tell what is dead wood and what is living wood, uh, dead wood or dead branches often have some tails. If you look close enough, sometimes you'll see brown spots or you'll see leaf spots. If you examine close enough, you'll see holes or the darkening of the wood or the thinning of the bark. But the telltale sign that something is wrong and the telltale sign that a branch is dead wood is that when the appropriate season comes, the branch will not bear fruit. Because ultimately, my brothers and sisters, what I want you to understand is that dead wood is not just the result of structural deformities. It's not just the result of trauma or, or, or fungi or bacterium or viruses, but those are all catalysts that induce a disconnect between the branch and the stem, between the branch and the shoot, between the branch and the truck between the branch and the vine. See, dead wood happens when branches are detached from the vine. They can no longer receive nutrients. They're cut off from the hormones. And so when branches are separated away from the vine, then they don't get the necessary sugars or minerals or sap or water to heal, they can't repair, they can't grow, they can't extend, and they cannot produce fruit. And so my brothers and sisters, that is why Jesus says, apart from me, 
You can do nothing. And beloved, I know this is not a botany lecture, but if you get nothing else from this message this morning, what I want you to understand is that it is only when you are connected to Jesus that healing will flow to you. It's only when you're connected to Jesus that strength will flow to you and that power will flow to you. It's only when you're connected to Jesus that goodness will flow to you and faith will flow to you and forgiveness will flow to you. I'm not talking about being attached to Jesus. I'm talking about being connected to Jesus and then grace will flow will flow to you and then love will flow to you and then life will flow to you my brothers and sisters we're, we're in the same context we were last week it's the same night it's the same situation uh if you're here last week you remember jesus blew up the disciples entire world he's in the upper room with them and he revealed to them that judas is going to betray me then he revealed to them that peter is going to betray me and because of those betrayals now i am going to have to leave you and so it's so simple to read that, but I want you to step into the upper room. I want you to step into the shoes of these disciples and not divorce the context. For three years, they were together. They ate every meal together. They traveled together. They studied together. They built this international religious movement together. The group was tight. The group was close. The group trusted one another, but now... They are walking to the Garden of Gethsemane and they have to make sense of the fact that both Judas and Peter have now turned their back on Jesus and blown this whole thing up. Both of them were trusted, Judas and Peter. Both of them were loved, Judas and Peter. They, both of them, they look like us. They, they talk like us. They laugh like us. They struggle with us. They worship like us. How did we not see this? How did we not uh, know that this was going on? Who else is fake? Who else? It's phony. Who else is not as real as they're seeming? So as they're walking, I'm guessing Jesus must have sensed what was going on. So he reaches down, he grabs a vine, and he begins to explain to them a very basic truth that everybody needs to know. And here it is, my brothers and sisters, that you ought never be devastated when people who profess Jesus act like anything but Jesus. And my brothers and sisters, you ought never be so messed up when you find out that uh, that when people who confess Jesus act like anything but Christian, people who confess Christ act like anything but Christian. My brothers and sisters, the truth has always been there have always been two type of disciples, two types of followers. There's always been living wood and dead wood, sheep and goats, wheat and tares. They both look the part. They both sound the part. They both play the part. They sing all the songs. They quote all the scriptures. They preach all the sermons. But here's the bad news, my brothers and sisters, you will never be able to tell who is real and who is raggedy. You'll never be able to tell who is righteous and who is ratchet. But here's the good news. The good news is that we have a vine dresser who is able to tell which branch is actually connected and which branch is actually attached. And beloved, I want you to hear this. I want you to really hear this, that you can fool me and you can fool them. But don't think for one second that you can fool God. Because God knows who is playing the part and who is the part. God knows who is saying the right thing and who is living the right thing. God knows who, who, who is trusting God that he'll work it out. And God knows who is just trusting God if it's working out. God knows who is praying that they be blessed and those who are praying because they are blessed. God really knows who really prays and who really studies and who really works and who really cares and who really loves. God knows those who don't care if anybody is looking. They don't care if they get credit. They don't care if they are in the light. I'm like, they don't care if folk honor them, but they just come to worship every Sunday. Grateful. They are grateful that they're not in the street. They are grateful that they, they are not in the hospital bed. They are grateful that they are not in a jail. They are grateful that their marriage is being held together. They are grateful that they got food on their table. They are grateful. So do not trip my brothers and sisters. Don't be paranoid. Wonder about who you need to cut off and who you need to push away because God knows who needs to be cut off. God knows who is the faithful among the faithful and God knows who was the disciples among the disciples. So don't trip. Don't trip. So Jesus, what he does when he grabs this vine, he, he, he gives them the truth um, of this relation, this relationship dynamic uh, by giving them this allegory or, or, or parable of the vine. And so um, here's the relationship. Jesus says, I'm the vine. My father is the vine dresser and you are the branches. And then he gives them uh, some essential and powerful truths about this relationship di dynamic. And here's the first truth. Uh, between the vine and the actual branches is that he's pressing upon you that when you look at this relationship, you should immediately think reliance. He needs you to know 
that you are absolutely reliant on me. And I want you to hear this closely. You cannot accomplish anything for God separate and apart from Jesus. That there are no victories made for God unless Jesus is involved. That there's no expansion of the kingdom of God unless you have God's involvement. Uh, but what you, I need you to see also is that reliance is not just what we do for God, but reliance also applies to who we are in God. Your personal transformation, your personal growth, your personal development, your personal strength, your power, your ability to do good. Everything is completely and utterly reliant on your connection to Jesus Christ. And I, I don't want to explain it this way. My, my wife is pregnant. She's in her third trimester. And like so many couples, what we do is like uh, we go online and we look at these pregnancy apps and, and, and we follow week by week the baby's development. And and they'll tell you how long the baby is and how much the baby weighs and which organs have developed this week and which reflexes are finally kicking in. And, and you start to do the kick counts. Uh, but any expecting couple will tell you that the most exciting thing and the highlight of any pregnancy is when you get to go into the doctor's office and they do an ultrasound. And so uh, we go into the doctor's office like anybody else. And because my because my wife is a nurse practitioner, her and the sonographer, they begin to have great discussions. They're looking at the screen and they're pointing out, oh, the baby has five toes and the baby has five fingers. And oh, look at the baby's little hiney. And oh, look at all. And so uh, me, I have no clue what I'm looking at. To me, it just looks like just mess. I And I'm sitting here listening and they're talking and I, I, I don't see a thing, but I try to chime in. Right. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at the screen. And I said, oh, poor. I said, the baby, she really got some long legs. And so court looks at me and she says, no, boy, that's not the leg. That's the umbilical cord. And so, I, you know, I just look like um, I, I knew that, you know. Uh, yeah. And so the, so the technician, she looks at me and she must have sensed that, you know, my feelings were a little hurt. So she begins um, in her voice to explain to me, well, Mr. Davis, um, let me show you this. This is the umbilical cord here and, and it flows in, in this little area right here. This is the placenta and it attaches there. And so there all the blood flows from mama to baby and all the nutrients flow from mama to baby. So so baby can grow and baby can develop and baby can have immunity. So 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 essentially that the umbilical cord, this is the lifeline between mama and baby and everything that the baby needs to get rid of. It flows from baby back to mama. And so it hit me. It hit me while I'm sitting there. I, I was sitting there thinking, I said, man, the baby is doing all of this kicking and all of this flipping and all of these somersaults and all of this sucking of the thumb, just living in her own world. But the only reason she has the strength and the energy to move and grow and develop and live is because she is connected to someone who supplies her with everything. And man, that is a word for you this morning, my brothers and sisters, that Jesus is not just your get out of hell free card. Jesus is not just your friend or your big brother or your role model. Jesus is everything. He is your strength. He is your joy and pain. He is your growth. He is your power in your words. He is the love that you have for enemies. He is your peace in the storm. He is your influence in evangelism. He is your victory over death. That's why the Bible says in him, we live and we move and we have our very being. He's your everything. So uh, I want you to notice that's the first truth, but I want you to notice that when Jesus makes his final I am statement, uh, he doesn't just say, I am the true vine, but the statement is actually longer than that. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. And, and, and to say that we are completely reliant on Jesus, that does not discount the father. Matter of fact, to be completely reliant on Jesus, it makes the father's job make sense because the father is the vine dresser, which means that he is responsible for pruning the branches. And so here's the second here's the second truth that the only way in which we are going to remain reliant on Jesus is if we ourselves become reduced. And I want to explain it this way, um, because I know everybody who's watching online, uh, not everybody understands the pruning process or even what pruning is. But it's simple. Pruning 
is simply just the reduction of branches. That's essentially what it means. It means that uh, a vine dresser comes out and just cuts things away and clips things off. If there are parts of the branch that seem diseased, the vine dresser cuts it off. Uh, if things have no place and they're out of place, the vine dresser cuts it off. Um, if the vine dresser needs to thin out the branches a little more so that the sunlight can get through, the vine dresser will cut things off. And sometimes pruning can be so aggressive that the vine dresser may elect to reduce the branch all the way down to the place of origin. So when Jesus says that you are the branches and that the father is the vine dresser that prunes you, I, I, I know that may not sit well with you, but this is here. This is where I want you to take comfort in it. Uh, that if the vine dresser is coming out to prune, you first need to understand that the vine dresser is an expert pruner. The vine dresser knows exactly what he's doing. So if the vine dresser prunes, then it is calculated. If the vine dresser decides that I am going to cut something away, then you can take solace in the fact that it is all part of a greater plan to improve the shape of the plant, to improve the health of the plant, to improve, uh, to make the plant more sturdy, to allow the plant to be able to withstand the environment better, to withstand the wind better, to withstand the rain better, to withstand the cold better and the heat better. So what are you saying, Brother Davis? I'm saying that when you're a child of God, God is constantly pruning your life. He's constantly trying to shape you to get you to look like Jesus, which means that there's some people in your life that is not going to make the cut. There are some uh, jobs in your life that are not going to make the cut. There's some relationships in your life that are not going to make the cut because that job could be destroying your spiritual health. That habit could be weighing you down. That problem could be blocking God's light in your life. And God has the prerogative to prune when he wants and where he wants and why he wants and how he wants. God, if, if God has the prerogative to prune you until you are reduced more and more and more and more and more until you finally realize that you do not know a person in your life that you need. There is no job in this life that you need. There is no opinion out there that you need. You, he's going to keep pruning you until you realize that goal that you think is up here. You don't need that goal. You don't need that title. You don't need that degree. But what you do need every day of every moment of every second, you need Jesus. And so he keeps pruning you. Until you reduce more and more and more. And then you realize that Jesus is all that I need. And when you get that in your mind, then you'll begin to hunger after him. And not money. You'll thirst after him. And not acceptance. You'll desire him. And, and, and not titles or power. But you'll also you'll know. I take shelter in him and I will abide in him. So that's the second truth. But then the final truth that I want you to see as we close out is that uh, when you hear that statement, I am the true vine, you should immediately think replacement, that this is a replacement motif that we find uh, throughout John's gospel. Uh, you find this idea of a replacement theology that goes through uh, uh, the full matriculation of the gospel. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, John seems to present Jesus as systematically replacing Judaism and all of its observances. And what I mean by that, John opens up in the very verse by arguing that Jesus is the word of God. In essence, arguing that Jesus replaces Torah. And then you flip over to the next, does Jesus replace Torah? Jesus replaces the temple. In which Jesus says, you destroy this temple. And in three days, I'll raise it back up. You flip it over, uh, another chapter, Jesus begins to replace the feast. It's the, when Jesus comes on the scene, it's the, it's the first Passover. It's the time in which the Jews will come and prepare the first Passover lamb. And it's John who says, here is the lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. But then he begins to replace the feast of unleavened bread in which he says, I am the bread of life. And unless you eat of me, you have no life in you. And then he replaces the feast of tabernacles in which he says, I am the light of the world. And then everybody knows that the heroes of faith are all shepherds. But Jesus says, I am replacing Abraham. I am replacing Moses. I am replacing David because I am 
the good shepherd. And everybody knows that any pious Jew is seeking after eternal life, seeking after the abundant life. But Jesus says, I even replace eternal life. And we talked about this last week when he says that I am the way, the truth and the life. So when Jesus says, I am the true bond, the question that you should be asking is what is Jesus replacing? And what Jesus is arguing here is that I am replacing Israel. I am replacing Israel in totality. And this is the reason why that the most common imagery for Israel in the human Bible is this depiction of the vine. You find it in Ezekiel 15, Ezekiel 17, Ezekiel 19. You find it in Isaiah 5. You find it in Jeremiah 2. You find it in Psalm 80. You find it in Hosea 10. But the thing about it that I want you to see whenever you go home and you begin to study this is that anytime it speaks about Israel being the vine, it is never in positive terms. It's always spoken as an imagery of judgment or destruction or failure or immorality or idolatry or unfaithfulness. And you find this redundant thing of fire and punishment. So Jesus does not say I am a vine. Jesus says I am the true vine, which means I am the true Israel. I am the true people of God. And what he's trying to get them to understand is that the totality of my ministry is that scripture and festivals and rituals and who you are mean nothing if you're not connected to me. And so I don't want you to lose it because Torah is not the only thing that Jesus replaced. And the feasts are not the only thing that Jesus replaced. And religion is not the only thing that Jesus replaced. And Israel is not the only thing that Jesus replaced. But in our text, Jesus is on his way to replace you. Because when you were guilty as charged, Jesus replaced you. And when you were an enemy of God, Jesus replaced you. And when you had a debt on your life that you could not pay, Jesus replaced you. And when you had a cross that had your name on it, Jesus replaced you. And when the accusations were true and the sins were too many to count and the judgment was too deserving and you had were awaiting a devil's hell, Jesus loved you enough to say, I'm going to step in and replace you. And so you ought to you ought to get excited when you read John chapter 15. And Jesus starts talking about, I am the true vine. You should think reliance. You should think reduction. But most importantly, you should think replacement. God bless you. I'm done. I hope you have been blessed by this series. We have made it through all seven weeks. If there's somebody out there that's watching, I encourage you to fortify your relationship with Jesus. I encourage you to be saved. The only thing you need to do is put your faith in Jesus. If you can understand that Jesus is everything, then you are already there. Put your faith in Jesus that he came, lived perfectly, died, did not stay dead, but got up with all power in his hands, showing you that he has power over death and sin. If you can put your faith in him, we ask that you just repent. Repentance just simply means that I'm no longer going to live for me and how I've always thought about living, but I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow him all the way to glory. If you're there, you're a fit candidate to be saved. We just pray that you reach out to us. Contact us at 6bcoc at yahoo.com. Let us know you're interested in being saved. We will have a protocol to stay safe, and we'll bring you in. And this is how it's going to go. We're just going to simply ask you, do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? The answer is yes. We will baptize you for the remission of your sins. You will walk out of here a child of God and a member of the Lord's body. If there's somebody out there who just needs prayer, we also invite you to reach out to us at 6bcoc at yahoo.com. God bless you. May God keep you. And happy Easter to everyone. What a God is awesome. God is awesome. God is awesome. God is awesome. He can move Keeps me in the past. Hides me from the rain. My God is awesome. Gives me when I'm wrong. The strength where I've been waiting. Forever he will rest. My God is in my 
Church, one of the most difficult scenes that any Christian um, can read about in the Bible is the account of the suffering that, uh, that Jesus endured, which led to his death. How he was forced before a crooked council, lied, on ridiculed, spit upon, beaten, and eventually crucified on an old rugged cross. He suffered for the sins of the world, and we recognize his grand act of courage, his, his extraordinary display of forgiveness, and we recognize his unchanging love for us by observing the Lord's Supper. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 26, Jesus, in the midst of his disciples, instituted what we know as the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Bible reads, now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and, and blessed it and, and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, we are eternally grateful for the love our Lord has for us, and through his magnificent sacrifice, we are able to have the hope of eternal life. Uh, now let us pray. Uh, thank you, Father, for, for who you are. Uh, thank you for your Son, Jesus the Christ. Thank you for uh, your love, your, your mercy, your kindness. Thank you, Father, for the sacrifice of your Son. Thank you for this unleavened bread that represents Jesus' broken body. And thank you for this fruit of vine, that, this precious cup that, that represents Jesus' shed blood. Thank you, Father, for another opportunity to just remember, to just remember our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Now let us uh, commune together. In the letter of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verses 6, the Bible reads, The point of this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for, for God loves a cheerful giver. Church, our giving is not about uh, how much we give, but the manner in which we give. We express our love for our Lord by giving from our heart, which is exactly how our Father gives to us each and every day, let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, we bow before you this time, giving you all thanks and all praise for another opportunity that you've given us to give back a portion of what you have entrusted us with. Father, thank you for these means that support ourselves, our families, and that support the cause of Christ. And as we give back, Father, we just continue to pray that we'll give back as you have commanded from our heart. Again, Father, thank you for this opportunity 
Thank you for most of all for the ultimate sacrifice of giving that you display for us in giving us your only begotten son. These and all blessings we pray in your precious son Jesus name. Amen. Now may we give. Thank you for joining us for morning worship. Now it's time for the closing prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for everything that you have done for us. Thank you for waking us up this morning. And thank you for allowing us to have this avenue of worship. And we'd like to pray that this virus doesn't spread any more than it has been doing. We know that you're in control. And again, we'd like to thank you for everything. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right, third week of the quarantine, uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, sticking with us and constantly tuning in. Uh, I also want to remind everyone to, to keep us and keep your loved ones in, in your prayers um, about COVID. We're praying for peace of mind during this quarantine. Uh, if you have prayer requests, you can email those into uh, sigsbycoc at yahoo.com. Uh, also, uh, make sure you stay connected with us. We've got Bible studies. All our weekly meetings are still going on. So uh, check your itineraries uh, and stay connected. Um, also, uh, last point, uh, if you need to come by to pick up communion packet or make your offering in person, uh, the church is open Sundays from 12 to 1 uh, for that. So thank you.